Howdy, Internet. My name's Doug Parker, and I'm the devil without a cause. I'm a web infrastructure engineer focused on making software development easier and simpler for everyone. Today, I've got a cool new web component library I'd like to show you. Hydroactive is an experimental library for applying hydration and interactivity to pre-rendered web components. We'll give a brief overview of the direction behind this library and then jump into a bunch of demos showing all kinds of cool stuff with it. Let's start with the problem. Pre-rendering HTML content with server-side rendering or static site generation is really powerful, and I want to take advantage of it more in my applications. The challenge is that it's actually really hard to add interactivity to those pages. Hydrating JavaScript and applying changes back to the DOM turns out to be a lot more complicated than you might think. Now, there are a number of existing solutions to this problem, though many tackle it by sort of hybridizing the application and making it run on both the client and the server. This is really powerful, but also adds a lot of tooling and infrastructure overhead to make it work, usually coupling the client and server together with special knowledge of each other. Then these solutions provide some kind of reconciliation layer to make the pre-rendered content interactive. This sometimes involves re-rendering the entire page on load, which is just wasteful and requires every component to work on both the client and the server, even for components that don't actually change on the client. And in general, it just doesn't fit my mental model. I want to think of each component as a server-side rendered piece of HTML. How we got here isn't too important. Servers are really good at rendering HTML, and there's plenty of great technologies to choose from. Once we're here, though, I want to think of this as simply finding the interactive page elements, such as this button, and setting up an event listener. When that button is clicked, all I want to do is increment the existing count. This should be everything we need. No side channel with props, no global page state, no magical server integration. That's the way I want to think of my server-side rendered application components, and that's the approach that Hydroactive attempts to enable. So the primary goal here is to make it easy to add interactivity to a pre-rendered web page. When the user interacts with the page, it should incrementally update the existing DOM. No re-render of the component or the whole page. No virtual DOM or reconciliation layer. The client-side application shouldn't even know how to render your component. That would be wasted bytes. Server already did that. This is also a fully decoupled solution from the server. There are no requirements on how your server is built or developed. It could be developed in Fortran for all I care. All it needs to do is output HTML. Lastly, I want to be compatible with the existing web ecosystem. Hydroactive isn't trying to take over your whole page lifecycle. It should be interoperable with components developed using other solutions. The library itself is pretty minimal by design. Again, it's scoped to just making components easier to write, not a full application framework. I'm also a big fan of TypeScript and use it for everything. So I wanted to make sure that was well supported here. And I think that's enough talking. I've got a lot of cool demos, so let's dive into the code. So here I've got the demo application running, showing a whole bunch of different cool examples. I'm going to walk through, show you the source code for how these work, uh, and hopefully show you some cool stuff. So let's start with reactivity. And one thing you'll notice is that a lot of these demos are increasingly complex counters, actually. Uh, so in this case, we've got a few different things. First one is just showing live updates. So we've sort of render initially with initial count of five, and then it increments every second. So let's check out how this can work. And let's dive in. First place to start to really start thinking about these is looking at the HTML. Now I said before how Hydroactive is all about pre-rendering a bunch of HTML content that's independent of Hydroactive. And then Hydroactive is just about making that uh, interactive and reactive uh, and hydrating from that content. So we're starting with the with this pre-rendered HTML content. Um, in this case, for, this, for these demos, I just have static HTML files. But of course, if you want a server that's applying some complex server-side rendered technology, if you want a static site generate uh, all this content, whatever you want to do, totally up to you. In this case, just static HTML is good enough for these demos. So what I'm doing here is I'm pre-rendering a live counter component. And inside of this, I'm using declarative Shatter DOM. Uh, if you're not too familiar with Shatter DOM, it's really not too important for this, but just kind of encapsulates some of the uh, some of the DOM elements so that they're not uh, so that they can't be easily dependent upon outside of this live counter. Um, but within there, we're rendering out the current count being five, and this is the thing that has been pre-rendered. Again, if you wanted to have, if you wanted to read this from a database, you could do that. Um, this is just for uh, demo purposes, just hard coding five, and then loading the script tag to actually implement this count. And what's cool here is that this five is the data 
that represents what the current count is. There's no other side channel. There's no props, no nothing. It's just that five is the one that matters. So how can we actually implement this? Well, let's look at the implementation. Um, tried to add a lot of comments to hopefully explain some of this, but I'll walk through it line by line. So we start here with the component function, which is the thing that comes from the hydroactive library. And within that function, um, this essentially declares a new hydroactive component, um, really a component class. And in that class, we're, uh, we're able to implement all the logic that we want to do here. And all of that happens in this callback function. And this function you can kind of think of as the hydrate function. It gets executed once per component when that component hydrates. And there's some nuances as to exactly when that happens, but we'll get to that uh, more later on. And this function gets the all important dollar sign variable, which is a thing that I couldn't think of a good name for. And in JavaScript, I've learned that if you can't name something, you call it dollar sign. And so this provides a whole bunch of useful functionality for how we can interact with this component, how we can read from, uh, from the DOM, how we can manipulate that over time. So what I'm gonna do with that is I'm going to use $.live, which allows me to create a live binding to a pre-rendered DOM element. And this actually does a bunch of different things that I've tried to explain here. Uh, the first thing is that it's basically querying for span in the shadow root. So this is a selector, and it's going to specifically look in a shadow root, find that span element, it'll assert that it exists. If, if it doesn't exist, that's an error, because you probably have a bad selector. Um, and then it will interpret that as a number. It'll read the text content of that element, parse that to a number. Based on that, it'll create a signal. Um, this comes from SolidJS. Um, which essentially provides some reactivity towards the system. I won't talk too much about signals, but uh, for the purposes of this, you can kind of think of them as a getter and a setter. So getting the current count, setting the new count, um, with the added benefit that we can observe all of the accessors that are being used in a particular context. And then whenever one of them changes, reevaluate that expression. I'll talk about that more as we get onto it. If you're interested, these are inspired by SolidJS. You can look more over there if you want to learn a lot more about signals. Um, I'll elaborate as we as it becomes relevant, but for initial purposes, you can think of this as a getter and a setter for the count. And last thing it does is it sort of binds any future set operations. So anytime you call set count, that will update the JavaScript representation. So if you call the getter, you're going to get the new count. But also it will bind it to the DOM, specifically the span tag that we're reading from. So if you set count to 10, the span element in the DOM will also update to be 10. And so live kind of does all of these things together and gives you back that signal. Um, and so there's a lot of power here in what it's doing. But what we can do with this in order to actually use it in a useful way, um, I'm just going to create a timer here. I'm going to use set interval to create a timer that runs every second. And when it does, I'm going to set the new count to the old count plus one, I'm just incrementing it once a second. And that set count implicitly calls or implicitly updates the span underneath it, reflecting the DOM and also updating the current count. Um, we do have this unobserved. That's for complex async reasons that I'll get into in the future. Uh, don't worry about it for now. I'll explain when it's a little bit easier to explain. Um, and there was also the notable thing that there's a memory leak here. But again, I'll fix that later. Trying to start simple, and then we'll add in some complexity as we get to it. Um, so this is mostly the implementation you actually care about. Some of the other sort of boilerplate-y things are that we get a live counter class out of this. This is actually a class. It's a class which extends HTML element. Um, so it is a proper web component, proper custom element. And we can use this by simply defining it with the custom elements API. If you're familiar with custom elements, this is something you've done a thousand times. But essentially, we're associating the live counter tag name with this class that we just created. Um, so that's the thing that will tell it which components are the things that we care about, which one should be hydrated. Um, the last thing that I'm doing here is declaring in the HTML element tag name map, which is really a mouthful, um, but essentially just gives us some better type inference. We're telling TypeScript that, hey, if you see an element that's a live counter tag name, that's actually an instance of this live counter class. Uh, that's useful for type inference. We'll see that come up later. So a lot of this stuff is boilerplate. Really, the lines that matter here that actually implement the business logic are these you know, two statements here. And that's sufficient to be able to get this to create a live binding on the span tag that started at 5, uh, and then every second incremented over time. So we've got a, a relatively straightforward mechanism for applying live updates to pre-rendered DOM. Let's take a look at the next one for binding. Um, if we look at bind counter, 
we have another component. Again, you'll notice a lot of the boilerplate being the same. Right? We've got a component, some logic in here. Then we were defining the custom elements, declaring the global for type inference. Most of that's going to be the same. It's really the part in the middle that we care about. So here we're going to be doing things a little bit more narrowly, doing some specific primitive operations. The first thing that we're using is doing $.hydrate to, again, query selector for span, read its text content, parse that as a number, and return. But at that point, it just stops. You just get the value. So this actually just has type number. This just has the value 10. because That's what we're starting. At. This gets pre-rendered the same way. We have bind counter. Uh, the current count is 10. That's what got pre-rendered. So that's the value you're going to get. So in this case, this just has a 10. And if all you want to do is read it, that's fine. You can stop there. Next thing we're going to do is create a signal around it. So we're creating our own signal with this initial value of 10. So count will have 10. And if you want to modify it, you can call set count. Then the next thing we can do is bind it. So we use $.bind to bind to the span tag. Again, this is a query selector, or this is a selector that's going to get query selected. And we're going to bind it to any changes that apply to count. So this is using the fact that you can observe signals and detect when things have changed. So we're going to see that anytime you call set count, bind is able to detect that and will update the span tag accordingly. And then lastly, we create our timer um, and apply the set count operation anytime this ticks. So what's important here is that it's it's functionally doing the same thing as live, right? We have an initial value, it increments over time, it's basically identical. The reason I have this called out here is just that it's using the primitive operations, right? We have $.hydrate to read from scratch. We're able to make our own signal from that, and then we're able to bind any changes down. And so live is just kind of a, a combination of all of those things, because a lot of times you want to do them together. but Doing things like this are, is useful if you want to read from one place of the DOM and then write out to another one, uh, which comes up more often than you might think. So kind of wanted to show that out just to show some of the primitive operations here. One other thing I want to point out, if you're not familiar, signals, this count, it is just a function. You'd call count with, uh, so count is an accessor, which returns a number, just a function that returns a number. And when you call it, you get that number. However, because of that, it means that you can do computed things really easily. You could say count times two, or parentheses around that, count times two. And then you're going to get double the count every time. Uh, you could use multiple signals. You could do anything fancier on that. So I just want to call out that with signals, you can compose things really easily with this and that it's pretty flexible in the way that it works. So um, for our purposes, we'll just stick with the regular count, but I just want to call out some of that flexibility. The last thing we have here is the listen counter. Um, let's show how it actually works. We've got listen counter, the current count is 15, and it's not incrementing every second, but instead we have a couple buttons. So it's listening to these events uh, and responding to them appropriately, which is a pretty common thing to do. How can we make that work? Well, when we pre-render this thing, we've pre-rendered two buttons, and kind of like I was showing in the, the slides earlier, what I really want is bind an event listener to this, and if you click it, it should decrease this number. And that's more or less all it should do. So how can we write it that? Let's bring up listen counter. And under here, we're setting up a live binding, kind of I showed before, because we want to read an initial value from this location, but then we want to be able to write to it afterwards. So I think that's uh, really useful to do. So here's a good use of live. But then we're able to use $.query to query the DOM and get a reference to the element. So in this case, I'm saying, find me the element with the decrement ID and return that. Query does a couple interesting things here. Firstly, it checks the shadow DOM, which is really easy to forget. I make that mistake all the time. That's frankly the number one use for this. It's just that it will check shadow DOM for you. Uh, secondly, it'll assert if the element is found, and it'll return it. And then thirdly, we have a couple of cool type inference uh, powers that this gives, which I'll show off in a little bit. What we're doing here is really just getting a reference to that. So I have the decrement button and the increment button. Then we can use $.listen to bind to that button. So we're saying when this button triggers the click event, please respond with this function. And that function just updates the count, decrements it for the decrement button, and increments it for the increment button. And $.listen gives a few different useful things. Firstly, it's, uh, it will automatically record when these events are triggered during hydration. And then it will detect that. And anytime this component is removed and no longer used as part of the document, it will remove these event listeners for you, which means that you don't need the add event listener and remove event listener as two different statements. Uh, $.listen will just do that for you. So there's no memory leak here. You don't have to worry about removing your event listeners. A side effect of this is that you don't have to, you don't have to keep a reference to this particular function. 
You don't need to have the one reference that gets shared between the add and remove, which means Lambda is just kind of work. You don't need a special reference for on click, do this thing, and then remove the on click. And also, just because of the way that scoping works here, you don't need bind this, right? It just has a reference to set count, and that just works. You don't need to bind. Um, so all three of these things are really easy mistakes for new developers to make, and I'm just really glad that this API removes all of that for you. And so you can just use a Lambda. It just works, and you don't have to worry about unsubscribing, and you don't have to bind. I, I really love that, and I wish that more frameworks were better about that kind of thing. And so based on that, we're able to implement event listeners. We're able to make the document or we're able to make the component automatically respond to user events. So that's basic reactivity for some of the uh, simplistic things you want to do. Next thing I want to talk about is a few other things you can do with hydration. Um, I'm going to bring this out for a second. And I'm going to slow things down to fast 3G and refresh. So you'll notice with this component is that it sort of loads a little bit slower, right? When I've got the network slowed down. Um, this text is not here initially. So it's saying, hi, I'm client side rendered. That's what I was trying to say. And then these buttons are disabled until their event listeners are loaded. So if I refresh, this gets displayed immediately, but I can't click these buttons. And then it's only until the JavaScript loads, the component hydrates, it displays this text, and the buttons now work, and they're enabled. So essentially what we're doing is we're sort of making the component clearly not functional when it's in this loading state. And then only once it is hydrated, it reconfigures itself, enables its buttons, binds the event listeners, and then becomes interactive for the user and also has some client-side rendering that's being done. So how does this work? Well, let's take a look at, I guess let's start with the HTML. That's maybe a good starting point for a lot of these. So here I'm rendering a hydrating counter. And under here, we're displaying the current count being five. And then we've got the two buttons. But what's interesting here is that I've put the disabled property on. them. So they're actually disabled by default when you when these things get downloaded by the browser and even before any javascript is executed these buttons are already disabled so what we need to do is when we hydrate we need to enable these buttons bind the event listeners uh, and then display some extra text that's not here notice that the hi i'm client side rendered is not here so let's take a look at that so under here we're setting up a live binding again of the count um, and then we're going to get a reference to the decrement button, which is already there. And we use $.query to get that reference, use $.listen to set up a click event, um, and then we're able to enable the button. And what I think is interesting here is that you might not expect that there you would traditionally get a type error if you used query selector on this. The reason is because uh, in this case, I'm able to determine that decrement is actually an HTML button element. Uh, I did not specify that as a developer, right? This particular line is commented out. But it's able to infer that the type is a button based on this selector. It actually, $.query actually parses the selector, uh, looks for a tag name, and then it says, oh, you, you have a button tag name, therefore this must be a button. And so as a result, decrement is an HTML button element. If I change this to say span, this would become an HTML span element because that's the only thing you could possibly get. And it would also have an error on disabled because you can't enable a span element. That's just not a thing you can do. So the important thing here is that basically on hydrate, I'm saying, please bind an event listener, please enable the button because it wasn't enabled before and do that for the increment button as well. The last thing here is that we're doing some client-side rendering. Um, I use simple web APIs for this, just creating an element, setting some text content and then appending it to the shadow root. But this could be a lot more complicated, right? Because Hydroactive is not intended for client-side rendering, but you can very easily put other frameworks or components inside your Hydroactive element. So you can say that maybe actually here, I want to render a lit element component, and that is client-side render, and that has a lot of flexibility there. Or maybe I want to bootstrap an Angular application or a React app. You can do all that kind of stuff here. So I think that's kind of important to show how that this can tie into other client-side rendered pieces. So maybe you have a, your main content is maybe client-side rendered, but the whole rest of your page of the header and the sidebar and the footer, that maybe is all static, uh, statically generated as part of your build. So all of those can be hydroactive components, but then you stick your very dynamic React app right in the middle of it. So here we'll notice hydrating from host attributes. We have a loading count that then gets displayed, then gets converted to the number 10. And what's happening here? Well, what often can happen is that you don't always have all the information you need when you render. So for example, here, I maybe don't know what the initial count is. Maybe this is something that gets statically generated at build time. And I don't actually know what the current count is because maybe it's user specific. Maybe the user needs to make an authenticated network request. Maybe it's data that's stored on the client. It's in local storage or IndexedDB. 
So instead, what I can do is display that actually it's loading. I don't know what it is right now. But then I can put hidden in an attribute. I can say that this is the counter with ID 1, 2, 3, 4. And under that ID, you'll find the actual data, which you should figure out on the client and then update the UI accordingly. So what I want to do is read this counter ID, use that to get the actual count, which the client just knows how to do separately, and then update the value with what that is. So let's look at that. Um, the way that I can do this is I can use $.hydrate, but instead of passing some some selector for a child in the shadow root, I use colon host, which basically means it's on the host element. So referring to this attribute counter is really what it's referring to. Um, from there, I want you to interpret it as a number. But instead of looking at text content like you normally do, I want you to look at an attribute. So we use this attribute referencing counter ID. Uh, attributes a thing that you can import from Hydroactive in addition to component. Um, so I'm saying, please look at the counter ID attribute. Um, interpret that as a number uh, and use this. So this gives me a reference to the ID really easily. And this one line of code, I'm able to read that attribute. It'll again assert that this attribute exists, assert the element exists, all that kind of thing. Um, I can use that to get the current count. This could use whatever it is that you want to do. It could go through local storage, make a network request, whatever you want to do. In this case, I'm actually just looking it up from a map. <laughs> just, you know, oh, if your ID 1, 2, 3, 4, then the value is 10. Um, but again, that could be however complex you want it to be. That gives us the initial count. Then we can make our own signal for this count and bind it out to the span tag. So again, this is one of those examples where I'm actually reading state from the attribute, using that to perform some logic in the background, and then binding out the output to another location. So we can't use $.live, but we can use hydrate combined with a signal, combined with bind, and make all of those things work together. And lastly, we set up the uh, the event listeners to be able to increment and decrement. So I can change from here over to so I think that's really powerful, again, just showing how, how flexible we can make it to be able to hydrate appropriately from different locations. Next, let's take a look at some of the more interesting aspects, I think, um, talking about the component lifecycle a little bit. So I mentioned earlier how the live counter, the initial one that I showed, how this has a memory leak um, in this set interval. The reason for that is because um, when we hydrate this component, we're creating a new timer, but we're never removing that timer. This timer always exists, it is always ticking. Even if I delete this component, even if I remove it from the document and throw it away, um, it will never get garbage collected. And it can't be garbage collected because this timer is always ticking. And when it ticks, it will increment the count. That count inherently is bound to the span tag, so it has a reference to the span tag. The span tag has parent and child bindings that reference the whole rest of the component. So basically just nothing can be garbage collected, which is why this is a memory leak. So the, the reasonable question you might ask is how do we do this in a safe way? So let's take a look at safe counter where uh, this looks very similar. I'm able to set up a live binding to the count, but then instead of making the timer directly, I use $.lifecycle. And lifecycle gives, uh, it essentially gives the ability to um, dispose of resources that we don't need when this component gets removed. So you pass it a callback, and in this callback, this callback will be invoked on hydration immediately. So pretty much immediately, we're going to create a new timer. But it also allows you to return a dispose function. And this dispose function will get executed anytime the component gets removed from the document. So that means that we create a timer. If you remove this component, it will clear that timer immediately. And at that point, we've released all the resources. Everything is now, if I drop my reference to that component, it is now unused, and the garbage collector can clean it up. Um, if the component ever gets re-added to the document, which is a thing that can happen, you can remove it in one place and re-add it to another, then this life cycle will get re-executed, and we'll create a new timer, and we'll set up a new disposer to delete that timer if we get removed again. So these sort of two things kind of repeat as many times as the component gets removed and re-added to the DOM. This will get looped. We'll still keep the same count, right, this hydrate this uh, hydration function is only ever called once per component. So we only have the one live binding and the count will always be maintained. We're not going to forget that. Uh, but we'll uh, disable and re-enable timers uh, as we go. So this is memory safe and it still works exactly the same way. Still counting every second. So that's kind of the way that you can do these sorts of side effects that require cleanup. Um, this is a great opportunity and a way to do that. Next thing I want to show is effects. So uh, hop over to effect counter. Um, the interesting thing here is that because hydration is a fundamentally a side effectful operation, 
it's generally fine to make a side effect in this hydration function. So here I'm just console.logging. That's fine. I don't care. Um, you might be used to things in React where sort of pure functional components are very useful or around removing side effects and pushing them to other places. Fundamentally, hydration is a side effectful operation. You are reading state from the HTML. You're applying event listeners. You're doing all these kinds of things. These are side effectful things. So if you want to do that, you want to console.log here, you want to add an event listener, that's fine. You can totally do that. Uh, you have to make sure that you undo it if the component gets removed, such as the event listener case, such as the timer case. So you kind of have to watch out for that. But if you want to do one-time side effects, that's fine. Um, so that's kind of what I'm calling out here, that you should be using you know, $.listen. That serves the purpose of event listeners. You can also use $.lifecycle. That's fine um, for things that you want to have a little bit more custom control over. But sometimes you want to make things dependent on signals. So in this case, I want to say that anytime the count changes, I want to log it. I want to log that this has happened. Um, so what we can do to make that happen is we can use $.effect. And what this will do is it will run the first time, and it'll say the current count is count, it runs that on hydration. But then it will remember that, hey, last time I ran this, I needed count to compute. This is the observability uh, feature of signals. And it knows that this signal required this count in order to compute. Therefore, whenever count changes in the future, I should rerun this effect. And so that's how it's able to set up this binding. So anytime I call set count, it will affect this function. It will rerun this function. So even this function of set count is able to rerun the effect as we expect. So because of that, I can, if I filter to effect counter, so you'll notice it printed that it hydrated once and the current count is 10 because it does that on hydration. And every time I click this button, it increments, the display increments and also the console updates. So because of that, we're able to apply this effect and change things over time. So this is mainly useful if you want an effect to be dependent on signals and to respond to them accordingly. Next thing is, again, we've been talking about sort of memory safety. Sometimes you end up with things that do need to be cleaned up from an effect. So actually to show what this is actually trying to do, the count is 15, uh, but there's no button to increment it. Instead, check the global counter object. So if I look at counter, you'll notice that this displays the current count is 15 and there's an increment function. So this count matches up. If I try counter dot increment, um, the value has now bumped to 16. And also if I look at counter again, counter is now 16. So we kind of have this like global object that's reflecting component state. And again, increment itself has a reference to this component. So even if I delete the component, as long as the increment function still exists, that component can't be garbage collected, can't be removed. So there would be a memory leak here normally. Um, the way that we can handle this is that I can still use $.effect. I can apply my side effects, such as just exposing to the window this counter object that I want to display here. But I'm able to return a, a disposer and say that actually, when we're done with this component or when we're done with this effect, please delete the counter. And what's done here is basically anytime this effect runs, it will first run the disposer for the previous effect. And then it will rerun the new effect. Um, and also, if you remove the element from the DOM, it'll run that disposer. So by doing this, we're able to make sure that it cleans up from itself appropriately. Um, in fact, I can demonstrate this if I grab the disposed effect. And then I just remove it from the DOM. So I've now deleted it. That no longer exists. And I can reference counter. And I see that it's not defined. So it was able to, when it got removed, it deleted this global variable, cleaning up all the references to it. And then it can be garbage collected appropriately. That's how we end up um, keeping effects memory safe and, and not leaking memory. Next thing is where it gets really interesting. So we have async effects. So let's consider a case where um, do I have async effects, where maybe I want to send a network request every time the count changes. So increment the count to 21, I'll say set count 21, and then I got back some HTML content. Um, if I look in the network, we can see that, oh, count 20, count 21, um, and so that's what it's sending. Every time I click this button, I want to send a new key. So it's just sort of an, uh, it's dependent on the current count, so it's an effect, but it's making asynchronous operations. How do we support that? Async tends to be hard, so how can we make this work? Well, let's, let's get a bit nuanced. I'll admit up front, I'm not 100% happy with it, but I think it's an interesting way to make this work. So for starters, you can use $.async effect, and this is identical to effect with three important differences. First one is that you get an async callback. That's kind of important. That's the whole reason that you would use an async effect. If you don't need that, just use $.effect. But you know, it's there. You should use it. Second thing is that you can't use signals directly. 
So what I have here is that I'm making a network request saying, please, you know, fetch the root thing with the current count. Now I have the count accessor up here from the live binding. And so intuitively what you might expect to do is do count accessor parentheses and using that as a signal. Um, if you did that in $.effect, it would be fine. That's exactly how you should use an effect. But in an async effect, this actually fails. And the reason for this um, is that because of the way that async context work, there's no way to associate this accessor usage to this effect because they are asynchronous. These things could happen very far away from each other from a time perspective. So this will actually throw an error if you try to do it. it basically says you can't do that. Um, you can't just use a signal arbitrarily like that. Instead, what we have to do is pass in the accessor as, the, as a parameter to async effect. And what that does is it will execute this accessor, execute this signal synchronously when the effect first runs. And then it knows, okay, these are the signals I'm dependent upon. If any of those change, um, I can rerun. And then it will pass those results into the callback function. So this count value is the result of this signal. So accessor is the, the function that returns the count. This is just the count. Uh, you can pass as many of these as you want. These are both, uh, this is a var args function for both of these. Um, so you can pass in whatever signals you need, you'll get back the results, and then you can use that. So instead of using the count accessor, I want to use the count value. That will work, and this will still create a dependency on the current count. So it'll still run correctly when I want it to, and has the dependency set up. The last difference is that disposing, or disposing works a little bit differently. Um, instead of returning a function, you'll notice I'm not returning a disposer to clean this up, because for an async function, that doesn't really work, because the... The component could be removed from the DOM before you've returned from your async function. And then when that happens, how do I clean up the state? Uh, it doesn't really work that way. So instead, this uses an abort signal, which is unrelated to these signals. Uh, no relation. Um, the abort signal is a built-in browser API, if you're not familiar with it, to be able to cancel asynchronous operations. And a lot of built-in APIs support abort signal and abort controllers. Um, so what happens is when I make this network request, uh, I actually pass through this signal. And fetch knows what that is. Fetch is able to detect, oh, if you are if you abort, I'm going to cancel my network request. What's really powerful about that is that it allows the async effect to not just create new network requests every time you increment the count, but it also gives an opportunity to cancel the previous network request that is no longer needed. And so what I'm doing here is using this fetch request, uh, just waiting some time, just slowing it down for demonstration purposes, and then printing out what I got. Um, but also I'm checking that, oh, if it's aborted, and if it's aborted, that functionally throws an error. I'm saying if it's aborted and I got an error with the right name, then I'm just going to print that it was aborted. So what's cool is if I go over here, every time I click this, it's going to increment and send a new network request. But if I click it two times quickly enough, it'll actually abort the previous one. And it'll say that actually the previous thing isn't used. We'll abort that, and then uh, we'll start a new one. So every time I click this, it's able to abort all those previous ones and send the last one, which I think is super cool. The last thing I'll call out here is just the unobserved that I mentioned earlier. The reason why we need unobserved in those other contexts, um, if we look back at safe counter, safe counter had unobserved here. And the reason for this is because in order to properly throw an error on using count accessor here, um, that actually means that we need to ban using any signal by default if it's not in a context that's being observed. Just the nuance of how this has to be implemented. And so anytime that you're using a signal that is not being observed by something to watch for changes, um, and you're okay with that, then you need to wrap it in this unobserved. I'm right? basically saying, yeah, I would like to use count. I know that nothing's going to reflect that. Nothing is going to rerun when I use count in this context, and I'm okay with that. So I'm specifically saying, uh, please execute this function in an unobserved manner. So that's why we kind of have to stick unobserved in these places. It's a weird trade-off that either you have to put unobserved everywhere you don't care that, that the signal is not being observed, or using uh, count accessor here would just work, but wouldn't rerun the effect every time. <laughs> and it's unfortunately, it's a weird trade-off between those two, two instances. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that this is the right choice between the two, but I think it's the most interesting one. And so that's what I picked here for now. So that is why we need this unobserved that we had earlier. Next, let's take a look at the at how we can reuse some of this functionality. So I've got another timer here that's just incrementing all the time. And this is like my sixth one now at this point. I, I really need to do better software engineering here and factor out some of this common functionality into a module that gets reused in all of these components. 
Um, so let's do that. Let's actually put this behavior into its own module that could potentially be reused across different components. Let's take a look at custom hook. And within here, we've got a custom hook component. And I'm able to use a timer function, which is this sort of uh, extracted library that implements this functionality. In this, this sort of hook, that is what I'm calling it. I'm not 100% sure that's the right name. But in this hook, I'm able to pass through the dollar sign function to give it access to this component, and then any other parameters it wants. In this case, it wants the selector to know what, what part of the DOM it should be incrementing. And afterwards, I'm going to get back a count accessor. So I can ping this to figure out what the current count is. And I can use $.effect to get that. So I can say, please, you know, anytime the count changes, please print it out. I can demonstrate that over here. We've got the custom hook printing out every second. And by doing that, we're, it, it does print correctly. So how does this timer actually work? Um, how do we encapsulate this functionality? I've got it down here. And a hook is really just a function. There's nothing special about this. There's no special handling for how this works. It says just a function, and it takes the dollar sign parameter as just its own input. Um, it can also take anything else you want, in this case, the selector that you want to affect. And based on this, we can just do whatever we want that we would normally do at hydration. So I can do a live binding towards this selector. Say, I'm going to interpret that as the current count. That's what the component requested of me. Then I can set up any lifecycle behavior that I want. In this case, I'm using $.lifecycle to create a timer, and then I'll properly dispose of it, keep everything memory safe. Um, and lastly, I'm going to return the accessor. So you can only read the current count. I'll deal with setting it, because that's my job. I'm managing the timer for you. I'll take care of that. And this mostly just works, right? You get back the count. You can bind it to an effect. Everything works here. You can reuse this across many different components. You can bind it to different elements within those, those components. Um, I think that's really powerful usage. I'm still skeptical if this really counts as a hook. I don't know. It looks like a hook when you use it up here, but I don't know if that really counts as just a function. But I think it really shows some of the power of this, that you know you can just have a function that can apply its own side effects based on this component. It can bind things to it. It can manage that however you want. It's just a matter of properly parameterizing things. Um, so with this, we've got a single hook that's able to be reused um, across the application. The last thing I want to demonstrate is if you want to reuse a hook, so in this, or if you want to compose hooks, so in this case, I've got one more example, which increments by two instead of one. Now I could set up a new timer. I could increment it by two. I could do set count, count plus two instead of plus one, but then you're repeating a lot of logic. So is there a way that we can properly re reuse the timer hook that I already have, but then make it increment by two instead? So let's take a look at that. Let's jump to uh, composed hooks. And in here, I've got a count uh, a count hook, which is more or less equivalent to the timer, except this doesn't actually mutate anything in the page. It just creates a new signal that starts at zero and it increments this every second and returns it. What's powerful here is that it is bound to the component life cycle. So if the component ever gets removed from the DOM, this will properly cancel its timer and restart it if necessary. Um, so I think that's really useful. For now, we're just incrementing by one because you know that's all we need to do. We're just counting up by one every second, just tied to the component life cycle. Then I've got the count by two function, which can reuse this. So I'm able to pass through into count and say, please increment, but tie to this component lifecycle and give me the value there. So this is the current count, just calling it accessor in this case. Um, then I'm able to return my own signal. So again, signals are just functions. They're functions that can really return anything. And so I'm able to say, take the initial value, take whatever count we're at, multiply it by two and return that as the new value. Then in this component, I'm able to use that by saying count by two, use the initial value from the span element, and then bind it out and say that we are going to mutate that element with whatever doubled the count is. And this works as I demonstrated. Um, it's able to increment by two every time. And it just kind of shows that we're able to have one hook up here that doesn't really know anything about the, doesn't know all that much about the component. It just counts by one. But then this is able to reuse that, but then and reuse its timer infrastructure to multiply by two instead. So I think that's super cool. So that's all the stuff around life cycles, and that's kind of the more complicated side of things. So the next thing I want to show is how certain components can compose each other in interesting ways. So what I've got here are more counters because it's just all counters. I you can tell I don't have a very expansive imagination of what cool demos could look like. So here we have some more counters that are implemented a little bit differently because they actually use two components apiece. 
So the first one we have are we have an outer component and an inner component, um, which are doing slightly different things. The outer component simply holds the, the buttons and the event listeners attached to them. So it has access to the increment and decrement button. The inner component, however, displays the current count. It knows, okay, the current count is five. I know that. But it doesn't know how or when it might change. Um, this is often if maybe the display component is very complicated. That's something that can happen. Um, maybe it's just, maybe you're just trying to separate concerns, right? You want to reuse this inner component in many different ways that these are, the things might be incremented or decremented. You know, maybe it's not always bound to a button. So how can we implement this to meet that need? Um, let's look at nested counter. And in here, we've got an inner component, which is just using a live binding to get a reference to the span element that it wants to modify. But then it, it returns something here. It's a little bit different than what we've seen before. Traditionally, in like a React model, it would return the, you might return JSX or return a, a, some kind of template which says, here is how this component should be rendered over time. That doesn't really apply to Hydroactive because the whole point is that we keep the HTML the same as what you had and just sort of apply little, little minor changes as you need them. So instead, what we do is we allow you to return um, specific functions that get exposed as the public API of this component. So we have decrement and increment, both of which just compose the set count function. Uh, but these are sort of the public API that I'm exposing. And anybody else that gets a reference to inner counter, you can call dot increment or you can call dot decrement. Those are the two things you can do with these. And based on this, we can use this API in the outer counter. So we can use dollar dot hydrate to get a reference to the inner counter element. And I'm actually passing in the inner counter class and saying, please don't change this, right? Previously, we had number here in order to read text content and parse that as a number. In this case, don't do that. Just give me a reference to the counter straight up. Uh, this will assert that you have the right thing. We'll assert that you do indeed have an inner counter, but then we get the correct type out of it. So we have the inner counter. This is sort of the type syntax. that was a little bit weird that I mentioned earlier, but it does know that yes, this does have a decrement and increment functions. Now, based on that, I can call dot increment. I can do this at hydration time, which is really powerful. There's some nuance to that I'll explain in a minute, um, but then I can also set up event listeners and say that when you click the decrement button, please decrement the inner counter and do the same thing for increment. And so based on that, we have a component, it increments, it decrements, all the important things of a counter. What is a little bit interesting here is that I was able to call intercounter.increment in the hydration function. This means that intercounter, the, the script has been executed and that that component has hydrated first. And so it means that if we look at actually the HTML, you'll notice that I actually pre-rendered five. And I can demonstrate this if I switch to fast 3G. Um, it actually pre-renders five, and then when the component hydrates, it increments to six. Um, so it's, it does that on hydration. And what's nuanced about that is that you can do this, and it's really powerful that you can do this, but there's ultimately no kind of hard requirements as to which component hydrates first. A lot of this is just done by ordering. Um, generally speaking, hydration will happen when you call custom elements.define. That will look for all inner counters on the page, and it will um, upgrade them to the inner counter definition, and then it will hydrate them. There's some nuances to that I'll get into later, but that's the, the general case. So as long as inner counter gets defined first before outer counter, you're fine. And this will work exactly as expected. If we rearrange these, in fact, let me just show that to you. If we rearrange these and put the inner counter down here, um, this now, uh, this means that outer counter will hydrate first and then inner counter will hydrate second. But as a result, when we get to here, increment doesn't exist because this code has not been called yet and demonstrate over here, you actually get an error. Um, I've specifically designed this to throw an error. Um, so it says, cannot access inner counter before initialization. What it's complaining about is that you have referenced inner counter up here, yet inner counter doesn't exist because it was defined down here. Um, the way that these are written, you don't get hoisting, so it actually requires that inner counter must be put above hand. I'm surprised TypeScript allows this. I would think that this should be a compile error, but uh, essentially what this does is it forces you to put inner counter first um, in order for this to work. And naturally, you really don't need to worry about this because import ordering will make this happen because in order to get this, you'd have to import inner counter, which is probably in some other file somewhere. And by importing it, that means that you're also importing the side effect of defining the component, which means that it will hydrate first. So for the most part, it'll just work and you really don't need to worry about it. There are some nuances. For instance, if I were to query for inner counter, this still works, it'll run, but it means that if I put these elements out of order, or I forget to import inner counter, suddenly I'm going to be hydrating things out of order and this will throw an error that increment doesn't exist. 
So there's some nuances here. I think as long as you use hydrate appropriately, as long as you use hydrate, you give it a reference to the thing that you're trying to use. Um, import ordering will mostly make things work the way that you want them to do. But there are nuances depending on exactly how you use these things. It is possible to get references to elements that haven't hydrated yet, and there's some nuance there. So things to keep in mind. I think for the most part, this is probably not too big a deal, but I can't imagine there will be certain instances where debugging gets tricky. So things to think about. Let's look at the next one, which is the state host counter. So we want to change things a little bit differently, and it's still a counter that goes up and down. It's important but I want to move the state. So we've got um, same examples rendered the exact same way. We have counter display, which renders the current count, but the buttons are at the top. The difference is that with nested counter, we actually put the current count is stored inside the inner counter and it exposed an API for how to, to interact with this. So the state actually lives inside the inner counter and the outer counter doesn't know what the current count is. It just knows it can decrement it, whatever it is right now. So how can we change this so that maybe the outer counter actually knows what the current count is and is able to modify it however it wants to? Um, we can do things slightly differently. Essentially, we just expose the a getter and setter on this element and say, you can get the current count and you can set the current count. I don't care how, maybe you're gonna increment it, maybe you're gonna increment it by five. I don't know, I don't really care. This allows us to be a little bit more flexible in the way that it works then we can use this in the state host counter to say that actually I'm gonna get a reference to this counter display, but then I'm just going to read whatever the current count is, right? Whatever that current count is, create a signal from it. I can then modify that to my heart's content. In this case, I'm incrementing it by one, but I could increment it by five. I could do whatever I wanna do here. Then the way that I'm able to reflect this change down is that I use $.effect to say that anytime the count changes, please update the counter display to the new count. That's really what it's saying. So this is the way that I'm reflecting that state down, back down into it. Um, and by doing this, it does work the way that you expect. It increments, it decrements, it does everything. It is your all-in-one personal counter. So this is sort of the, it's the same example, but it's just moving the state into a different way. We're, we're maintaining that state in the outer component, not in the inner component. Um, what's interesting is that you can actually have two signals to do this because we're actually putting state in two places. But one is just kind of mirrored of the other. So I don't know, I'm still... Not 100% this is the right way of doing things, but I think it's good enough for demonstration purposes and we'll see how things evolve in the future. Next, we have a higher order components where things get a little bit more interesting. Well, firstly, the, the main thing you'd want to do with a higher order component is just display it. So I did that here uh, There's a higher order component. It says, hello, hello from the lower order component, which goes first, and then hello again from the higher order component. And I'm able to make this work with declarative shadow DOM. It just works. There's nothing really special here. Um, I've used declarative shadow DOM. I can define that here is where the lower order component goes. Anything in my light DOM gets put inside here. And so I can separately render a lower order component that goes inside here. This keeps encapsulation, but whoever renders higher order component can choose what its children are. I can say, I want to put a lower order component inside of you. So this just works. There's nothing hydroactive here. There's not even a JS implementation for this because declarative shadow DOM just does it. So I wanted to point out, it's a thing you can do. It's really a declarative shadow DOM feature, not a hydroactive feature. What's more interesting is maybe when you want to connect some of these components in interesting ways. So let's say how, if we wanted to have components interact with each other, we've got an outer component, which is maybe an event handler. This maybe has knowledge of the particular count, whatever that currently is. Um, and then the inner component is responsible for dispatching events that says, hey, the user is requesting this, the user is requesting that. So in this case, we have buttons. It can just promote and say, hey, um, user click the decrement button, please decrement the count. Then it's up to the event handler to respond to that. And because there's sort of higher order components going on here, um, you can really put whatever you want here. Uh, event handler is not tied to event dispatcher. These should be different things. So how can we make that work? Well, let's look at event counter. And in here, we're using general DOM APIs. Again, hydroactive doesn't assume that other components are hydroactive. So what I'm doing here is in the event dispatcher, that's the inner component, I'm setting $.listen. Um, on the decrement button. And whenever that happens, please dispatch an event for to decrement the count. And I do the same thing for increment. And dispatch is not special. Um, this is literally just doing $.host.dispatch event. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but uh, $.host is just a reference to the custom element that this actually is. It's basically a reference to event dispatcher is really what it is, uh, to this instance of event dispatcher. So these are basically the same. I don't even know if $.dispatch is all that useful, but I left it in just because. <laughs> um, so you're just dispatching events, that's all you're doing. Then in the event handler, you're able to use $.listen to catch it. So 
So again, we're actually using $.host here saying, listen on the host element itself, listen for count decrement, and then if so, decrement the count. And this all works the way that you would expect. I can demonstrate over here. The last thing I'll show for composition is about context. So this is another one that gets a little bit nuanced, but we've got a, uh, we've got a little bit different situation where in this case, the, outer, the higher level component, the higher order component, knows what the current count is. It knows, hey, the count is 20. What I want to do is provide this through context to any element underneath me and say that you can detect what the current count is and you can display it however you want to do. So in this case, I have context receiver. It displays what the current count is. doesn't know what that is initially because it's kind of rendered independently, but it can receive this through context and display it to the user. The outer component does know when this increments and decrements. So I want to be able to uh, update this value over time and anything underneath me should reflect those changes. The uh, last thing I want to point out is just that this the child component could be very far away, right? I've got one div here just to illustrate that there's a separation between the two, but these could be very deeply nested component that's under a provider and we should be able to get a reference to it. So I have my own kind of implementation of context, um, which has a few different nuances to it, but it mostly solves this problem. We start with context.create, um, which is basically just saying, hey, I have I want to represent some context that is going to be called count. And the count's really, the name is just for debugging purposes. Um, but it's just a reference to some context that will be filled in later. Then the inner component is using $.weightContext to listen for that. It's saying, hey, whenever something provides this count that is above me in the DOM hierarchy, please give me that, that signal. And so it's, it's wrapped in a signal, and I'm able to use this to bind to my span. I mean, it was basically saying, hey, whenever you get that thing, just bind it out, uh, write it to the, to the DOM. And then the parent component or the, the provider is able to create this itself. So I'm able to get a signal for the count just to get the initial state. So hydrate from the host attribute, right? We're using host attribute uh, hydration as we've demonstrated earlier. Box that into a signal, wrap some event listeners for it. But then I'm using $.provide context to be able to say, hey, provide this through the, the context that I gave, the count context. And uh, I'm giving it a signal. So automatically update this anytime the signal changes. Those are the two, two main things it's doing. So it's providing this context and it's evolving it over time. So this one line is basically doing everything we need to do in the provider. And with the receiver, we're able to receive this and bind it out. So this works as you expect. It increments, it decrements. We're all happy. There's a couple interesting nuances here. Firstly is hydration timing. Um, so I mentioned before how import ordering kind of forces certain elements to hydrate before others, which is really useful in a lot of situations. When you... Um, particularly when you have knowledge of what component you actually want. Um, you know, previously we had the nested counter. We know that the outer counter wants the inner counter. Therefore, inner counter should hydrate first. However, with context, a little bit differently because these components don't have knowledge of each other. They don't have references to each other, which is by design. That's the whole point. Um, you know, they don't have to have knowledge of each other. But it means that ordering gets a little complicated. Basically, it's kind of non-deterministic as to which one gets sorted first. It really depends on what your bundler is. Just whichever one happens to get loaded in first is honestly what happens here. And so as a result, it becomes a little bit harder to know when things are going to be executed. In this particular case, I have the custom elements defined for the receiver before I have the provider. So in this particular case, it means that the receiver will hydrate first. And what's interesting with that is that it means that when it requests the context, uh, nothing's actually provided it yet. The, the provide context function down here has not executed yet. And so as a result, we can't just get the context because it doesn't exist yet. Instead, we actually get a promise to the context. It's a little bit different. Um, so we get a promise to the context, which eventually when somebody provides it, this promise will resolve and you'll get that state. What's interesting here is that uh, $.bind is okay with that. It will accept the promise. So you mostly don't need to worry about it if all you're going to do is bind but this can be complicated in other instances. You can alternatively use $.useContext, which is this case. Um, you can say useContext, which will immediately return, so you don't get the promise. Uh, you just get an accessor directly, but you have to provide initial value because this, this may not be provided, so you have to provide some default thing if it's not there. It's a bit nuanced in the way that that works. Again, hydration timing gets a little bit complicated. Um, in general, weight context, I think, should be pretty safe for this. And what's also interesting is that you can specify a timeout on this. So I can say wait forever because you know at some point this is going to get uh, this is going to get provided, or you can say wait task, which is the default behavior. It basically says wait one microtask, and that basically means that I expect it to be 
provided at some point in the initial load. So even though these are out of order, I still expect that it should load synchronously, more or less, is what I expect to happen. Um, so this way you'll get an error if it's not provided. You get a nice error message saying that this thing was not provided. You probably need to put it under some other element. So for the most part, you, I think we do the right natural thing. It's just that there's a lot of nuance around exactly when these when hydration timing happens and it gets a little bit nuanced. So task is the default, which I think is nice. just gives you a good error message. But alternatively, you can say, ah, just wait forever because it'll happen at some point. I don't really care initially because maybe I have a default or something like that. I don't know. Uh, the one other uh, notable difference with context is that um, I mentioned before how Hydroactive doesn't assume that other components have, the other components are implemented with Hydroactive. There's an exception for context because there is no generic implementation of context. There is a proposed community protocol for it. Um, it didn't quite handle this hydration timing thing is why I don't use it. Um, so I didn't implement that particular protocol, which means that if you wanted to, in a, if you wanted to share context with a hydroactive element, you'd have to use the same context implementation, which is possible. I have it as a separate module. You can, it has an imperative API to output things, but it is something you'd have to have knowledge of hydroactive to do it. Not super happy with that. I'm hopeful that the protocol, the community protocol can evolve over time a little bit. Um, and hopefully support this kind of hydration timing issue um, are the main things that I'd, I would need it to do. So that's the one nuance. Again, this is an experiment, so I'm kind of okay with it for now, but that's something that I'd probably want to resolve at some point. Last little thing I want to show off is around deferring hydration. So everything I've shown so far um, hydrates immediately. Just as soon as it's downloaded, it's JavaScript, it just hydrates all the components on the page. However, sometimes you don't necessarily want to do that. You've got something like in this case where I have a component, it displays what the current count is, and it's got some buttons, but these are disabled by default. In fact, if we look at the HTML for this, these components are disabled by default. And um, what I want to do is actually not hydrate it until later. So the users interacted with it in such a way that I know that they're interested in this, that I'm willing to pay the cost of actually executing the code to hydrate. In this case, I just have a load button. When you click that, it hydrates. These buttons are enabled, and I'm able to increment, decrement it, so on. The way that we implement this is through the defer hydration community protocol. I talked about context as a community protocol out there that I couldn't really use in this case. Defer hydration, I could. So the way that you do this is you put the defer hydration attribute. This essentially tells Hydroactive, do not hydrate this thing immediately. Wait until something else on the page removes this defer hydration attribute. And I implemented this down below with the, the ancient JavaScript event listener syntax. <laughs> Not really proud of this. It's not good. Don't do it. Um, content security policy hates it, but good enough in this demonstration where I basically have a load button which says, anytime you click this, remove the defer hydration attribute. And in doing so, Hydroactive detects this. It triggers the hydration and takes effect, which is how I'm able to set up this load button to work. So it doesn't do anything by default. And then when I click it, it pops in and starts working. What's interesting here is that uh, if I look at the implementation of this, it is completely uninteresting in every way. This is basically identical to the components I've seen before. You have a live binding, you create an event listener, you enable it. That's basically the only interesting thing is that the buttons are disabled by default and then the component enables them on hydration. But otherwise, that's fine. Nothing in here, I didn't have to write the component any differently to support deferring hydration. I mean, the reason for that is because Hydroactive does all of this for you, so this function doesn't even execute until defer hydration is removed. So until I click the load button, I can actually demonstrate that if I flip to... Um, yeah, right here, deferred counter. If I put a breakpoint right here, refresh the page, it doesn't execute, nothing happens. Uh, your user code is not invoked. It's only when you click load, that is when it hydrates. Um, and that is when all of these things are effective. I think that's super cool. And it's able to just kind of work. You really don't have to think about it. I think that's, that's really powerful. I have another example, which just demonstrates composition. So in this case, I have an outer counter, which is deferred. I've put defer hydration on the outer counter. But then I have an inner counter inside of it, which also gets deferred. The, I, the load button I have still only removes the previous element. So it's referring, it's removing this defer hydration and only that defer hydration. However, Hydroactive is aware of this and it knows that, hey, when I'm hydrating, probably the things underneath me should hydrate too. So it'll do that. And it will still hydrate both of these elements. Um, they still work together the way that you would expect. If we look at the implementation for this, it is pretty much identical to what I showed before, right? It exposes increment and decrement functions. Um, again, just nothing unique about this. And the outer component does the same thing. Get a reference to the inner one. I chose to increment it on hydration just to demonstrate the timing, that this actually forces the inner component to hydrate first. 
then backs out to the outer component and hydrates that. So I can this reference is immediately valid. You don't have to worry about invalid states. And I can set up my own event listeners for it. So again, that's why it starts at or it starts at 10 when the HTML loads. But then when I click the load button to hydrate, it increments to, to 11. Um, so again, we're kind of demonstrating how, how hydration can be deferred. This is why hydration timing gets a little bit more nuanced because I'm able to make it dependent on who wants to use it. Last little thing I want to show is how we can make this a little bit more flexible. Because defer hydration is a community protocol, it means that anything can defer or trigger hydration for any other component without necessarily knowing anything about how it's implemented. For example, um, you may be familiar with the isLand component. This is something that um, Zach Leatherman has developed, really great guy, you should definitely follow him, but it's a component for being able to trigger, uh, to set up and configure islands on the page of different pieces of interactivity, and then defining different semantics for how you want those to get enabled. Maybe some are when the user clicks on it, maybe others are when the page is idle, maybe others are hydrated immediately, I don't know. So you, it has a lot of functionality for choosing how and when it wants to hydrate. So in this case, I'm saying when you interact, basically saying when you click on this thing, um, please import the definition. So it's lazily importing the JavaScript, which is something that I haven't really done before. Lazily imports the JavaScript, executes it on the page. And as of isLand 3.0, it will remove the defer hydration attribute for you. It'll just remove it. And that tells this island counter underneath it that yes, please hydrate. This is now the time for it. So by doing that, if I just click anywhere on this component, it hydrates, it's able to increment decrement. That's really powerful. And if we look at island counter, again, nothing at all interesting here. I did not write it to be compatible with this. Um, it just naturally supports this model. And so because of that, this, um, you can sort of compose it with other elements that have knowledge of defer hydration. They're able to work together really well. Um, what's also cool is that I actually have another one which is identical to this, right? It's isLand again on interaction. It's importing the same thing and it's using the same element, but it has a different defer hydration attribute, right? These are two, diff two defer hydration attributes. And so what's powerful here is that even though I, even when I interact with one and I click it and it loads, the other one is not. The other one doesn't hydrate. We don't waste time on something the user didn't care about. This is something that's actually kind of tricky in the way that isLand has worked before but it's something that defer hydration handles really well. So it'll, this one only hydrates when I actually click that one and now it becomes active. So again, I think that's all really cool and I realize I'm calling it is land. I know it's supposed to be island, but I just cannot read this any other way. So I'm just gonna keep calling it is land. So I think that's really cool. And again, it kind of shows the power of these community protocols, the way that different component libraries can interact with each other. Um, without necessarily having knowledge of each other's implementation. I think that's really powerful. So that's pretty much everything that I had to show. These are kind of all the meaningful demos here. Um, I will point out, I have another set of demos for class-based stuff. These basically work the same way. They have some slight differences, but they're more or less doing the same thing. What I've shown here is what I call the functional API uh, because it's, you know, there's a lot of functions in here, not a lot of classes. Uh, I don't think I don't think the word class appeared anywhere in here, but I have other implementations such as this, which were much more inspired by a lit element. And so in this case, you sort of extend a hydratable element and then you use decorators to mutate things. So instead of $.live, you use at live, and this basically works the same way. Um, you don't use signals, but instead you use, it's really getters and setters is what it's doing here. There's an automatic setter. When you modify the count, it will reflect that into the page. So this still works the same way. Um, and if I look at you know, bind counter or the other class-based bind counter, um, again, you have at hydrate, kind of like $.hydrate, and then at bind, which is kind of like $.bind. I kind of like at bind better. Um, I think that makes a little bit more sense. But for a lot of the other things, I thought that the functional approach was, if not better, then at least more interesting. And as of now, I'm kind of picking the more interesting approach just because that's what I want to talk about. Be interested to see you know, if you want to uh, experiment with some of this. You can npm install hydroactive. And within there, the functional API is kind of the thing that you get by default, but you can import from class. Right? Hydroactive slash class, you can play around with that too. So that's everything I wanted to show for Hydroactive. If you want to try it out, you can npm install Hydroactive. Uh, it's all experimental, so you know don't use it in prod yet, but feel free to play around with it. Love to see what people think about it. Even I'm not convinced that everything I've shown here is a good idea. Hopefully I've tried to talk about some of the weird trade-offs and things that come up as part of it. But please try it out, let me know what you think. Uh, in particular, I'd really like to know, is this a problem that you have or that you'd like to see solved? Do you think that Hydroactive actually solves it? Is there anything else you'd like to see added to it? How do you feel about the functional versus class-based APIs, right? I kind of showed functional because I think that's a little bit more interesting. 
but you know that doesn't necessarily mean it's better i'm interested to hear what people think i'm not really here to be like a youtuber uh, don't expect regular videos from me but i do think videos can often be the best way of presenting new ideas of showing cool new things and i thought that it'd be much more engaging to walk through demos of all these things show the code do that kind of thing i felt that was better than having a really long blog post about this and I realize this video is very long and I apologize for that. If you want to see more content, you can follow me on Mastodon. Uh, you can also take a look at my blog. There's more interesting stuff here. But with that, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.